In this live stream, we will meet uh, Dr. Fabio Menchetti and we will explore the different paths we can follow to become a professional pianist. A native of Lucca in Italy, Dr. Fabio Menchetti maintains an active uh, international performance career. He has uh, presented concerts uh, in many Italian cities, in Florence, in Bologna, Lucca, La Spezia, Parma, Torino, as well as in Poland, uh, France, uh, and also in Germany and in the States, I would say. So uh, welcome uh, to this channel. Introduce yourself. You know yourself better than me. So tell us what you do and uh, how you became pianist. So how did, did it happen? Okay, sure. So uh, thank you for inviting me first. And I'm happy to be here and, and just sharing my experience on uh, Web Piano Academy. So my name is Dr. Fabio Menchetti. Uh, I'm a pianist. I teach piano at Washington State University uh, in Pullman. And I, I moved to the United States in 2014. And I, I came here to pursue a Master of Arts at Houghton College. And that's when I, uh, when I met Dr. Antonella Di Giulio. Then I moved for uh, my doctorate to Cincinnati. So I did my, my doctorate at CCM. Uh, and since uh, August 2020, so right in the middle of the pandemic, uh, I've been here in Pullman, Washington to, uh, to teach at Washington State University. And so I teach uh, piano lessons, I teach piano pedagogy, I teach uh, piano literature, and I also supervise the Piano Pedagogy Lab School, which is a sort of a community school or prep department. Uh, um, and of course, I, I maintain a uh, performance uh, activity. Uh, I really like uh, going to universities, churches, any any kind of venue, any kind of setting where people are are eager to to listen to good music, hopefully to a good performance. And uh, yeah, that's 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 my introduction. Uh, so you studied in Italy, right? Uh, did you want to become a pianist? Oh, yes, I, I did forget to respond to your question on how I became a pianist. So that's that's a, always an, an, an um, interesting question because uh, I know that uh, many, many performers say, oh, when I was five, I decided I want to become a violinist. When I was eight, there was a pivotal moment in my life. And that never happened to me. Uh, and, and I think it, it was probably uh, very good in the sense that I, I never had the stress of pursuing a career when I was a child. So um, things started very, very naturally. Uh, actually, I ended up taking piano lessons just because my older sister uh, was taking piano lesson and the piano teacher was our neighbor. And so I, I just tried uh, and I discovered that it was fun. Uh, my first piano teacher was, was an amazing teacher, an amazing man. And so I was constantly exposed to music. Uh, my parents are not musicians. They, they just like music, but they have no musical training at all. And so after uh, five years with this private teacher, um, he realized that I, I could pursue a musical career, but he put it very nicely. He simply said, I think, you know, you should move with another teacher who has more expertise. And so I think you should um, join the, the local conservatory. My hometown, Luca, has a, has a, a conservatory. And so things really happened very naturally. And so I didn't have a specific moment in which I said, I want to become a pianist. Now, that the switch from private lessons to the conservatory was a, was a big moment. But I was kind of almost unaware of that, you know, as, as it happens when we are teenagers. And so I just realized day by day that I was uh, more and more involved. And, you know, of course, I, I moved from a little uh, private studio to a conservatory. So I had the opportunity to listen to people who were <clears throat> older and better than me. And so it's like, oh, wow, one day I want to play those those wonderful pieces. And so that's that's how, how it kind of happened. And so I chose a high school that gave me enough time <clears throat> to practice in the afternoon. Um, and so I would say that probably during those years at, at the Luca Conservatory, I, I kind of thought, okay, that's what I want to do. Um, and 
does that mean that I, I knew how to do it? No, <clears throat> I just had this, this dream. I want to do it somehow. And so, uh, so things move, move forward with, you know, as usually happens with very bumpy, uh, bumpy routes. I had my ups and downs. I had moments in which I felt great. I had moments in which I thought of quitting. Um, and so, you know, long story short, after a lot of musical training in Italy, I decided to leave in 2014 and then, uh, you know, try to, to establish myself in the States. Yeah. So I, I remember I have a similar story because I started taking piano lessons because I I was taking dance classes, ballet classes, and my dance teacher, I was five, so my dance teacher was requiring us to take music lessons. But the dance studio was far away, so my mom said, well, you know, I, I really cannot drive again, you know, another day a week. Uh, for music lessons in the dance studio, why don't we take piano lessons locally? So that's how I started. And I didn't I didn't want to become a pianist or musician. I wanted to, to become a scientist actually. And um, and then at one point, yeah, the conservatory switched everything. Because in the conservatory you have actually to work hard <laughs> to, to maintain a certain level and to practice a lot in order to, you know, get there and to pass your exams and uh, all those classes. It's very intensive. So once you enter the conservatory, um, you, yeah, you have no choice but to practice, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I think the structure is meant to be um, formative for pianists in Italy at least so if you really stay in the conservatory then you have to practice and uh, you probably will become a pianist right because you practice yeah. so can you tell us a little bit uh, how you practiced when, when you were in the conservatory so, and the path was pretty similar to for everybody oh. so actually when I when I took my exams uh, like the fifth year exam eighth year and, and the diploma um, the conservatory in Luca had approved some experimental programs. Uh, mm -hmm. So my program was way more flexible than the program you probably had to take with a lot yeah. of implementy and, and very, right. very rigorous and unflexible, I would say. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was really happy actually to have these different programs because I thought there were a good balance between something old, but a little bit more flexible. So for example, I do not remember the details, that's too long ago, but I remember that for the um, eighth year uh, exam, I had to play uh, three sonatas by Scarlatti and then mm -hmm. there was a, a mandatory, there was a, a Beethoven sonata. And then we had prelude and fugues, but we didn't have 24, we had eight. Mm -hmm but we were asked to perform uh, you know one of those eight on the spot there was not mm -hmm. like the 24 yeah. hour uh, thing as as you 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 had we had only five etudes by clementi but we mm -hmm. also had uh five etudes by romantic composer so i thought mm -hmm. that actually was really good because instead of learning 23 etudes by clementi i i remember i played a couple of etudes by chopin uh, I played one by Scriabin, I think. Uh, now I don't really remember them. Maybe one by Kessler and Moshless, things like that. So we had a total of 10 etudes. Uh, then there was, um, at, at least in Luca, there was um, a mandatory uh, work by Mozart. And you could mm -hmm. choose either a sonata or the first movement of a piano concerto. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had to play a piece either by Debussy or Ravel. Yeah. And then we had to play, uh, of course, some romantic pieces. Those were like two romantic pieces. Um, and then uh, we also had to play two 20th century pieces, one of which had to be written after 1950. And so we didn't have to play everything. Like we had to learn everything, but like, you know, I presented three sonatas right. by Scarlatti yes. and then I, uh, the, the, the panel picked one and then eight prelude and Felix, the panel picked one. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and it, I think it, I think it was really beautiful because I was exposed again to a lot of pieces, and you know, and and also the student was was pushed to learn music by different composers, and and different periods as well. And for my final diploma, I once again I I presented an experimental program, 
and we had to present four etudes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, if I remember correctly, I think we had to play all four. Mm -hmm. uh, and so again, I play one by Liszt, two by Chopin, and one by Scriabin. Uh, then we had uh, Beethoven Sonata, and then we had uh, to choose one big work by Romantic composers and some works by um, 20th century composers. So it, it was less detailed, but okay. it was it was a pretty big program. Remember, I played uh, on top of etudes. I play um, Beethoven Opus 111, and then I play Schubert Wander Fantasy, mm -hmm. and then I played uh, Prokofiev first and third piano sonata. Uh, and yeah. so that, then it's more similar to a senior recital here, I would say. Yeah. Maybe, maybe yes. you know, it was a little bit longer and of course the etudes were there. Now, you have been in the States uh, for long enough that you know what type of training the students receive before coming to the university. Mm -hmm. And then by working uh, at the university where you are at, and then obviously you have um, the possibility really to see, you know, what type of curriculum uh, piano teachers follow over the years so um what are the main differences and what do you think could be improved mm -hmm. well i i think that something that works really well in the american curriculum is the flexibility so mm -hmm. like the students can choose a, you know a free program for their junior recital for their senior recital it's something that mirrors what i experienced with the experimental program so that's yeah. that's something that is extremely valuable and actually stimulates the the teacher and the students creativity you you don't have to play the same pieces over and over because that's what is required so you're actually uh, you're actually pushed and it's like, okay, how do I want to craft my own thing? And I think mm -hmm. that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes, uh, you know, the, there is a little bit of too much flexibility in the sense that when there are no strict requirements, then students and teachers can find some sort of leeways and they can, you know, they can put a program where all the pieces are, I don't want to say easy, but maybe they don't really um you know they don't really push the student uh beyond their comfort zone or or you know they, they can avoid certain styles that they don't feel comfortable uh you know playing and so you you could theoretically graduate without ever playing a Bach prelude and fugue or without ever playing uh i don't want to say a Mozart sonata but but a piece that is strongly based technically speaking on, on certain patterns that that a pianist should master uh, so yeah you you can come up with a very creative program but then uh, you may um, you know you may not be ready to play some right. pieces that it's not because they are traditional repertoire is that is that because they contain technical and musical elements that should be required to you know, for everyone, regardless of, of you know, right. their, their taste and their preference. So um, that's that's something that I that I notice when students are in school. When students come to school, I think that sometimes the same problem happens. So you get students who are 18 years old, and then you ask them, okay, what, what pieces did you play? And they, they just play, like, the greatest hits. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, and, and you see that, uh, maybe they didn't get that that training that goes through etudes, uh, polyphonic works, classical works, romantic works, and, and 20, 20 and twenty first century works. So uh, I, I think that if people want to become, I don't want to say pursue a career, but they want to become proficient pianists, they should approach the university college already with that mentality. Okay, maybe maybe I'm expected to play some sort of polyphonic work. Maybe I'm expected to have some technical chops and that, that I can learn only through not a specific composer, but a specific type of repertoire. So for right. example, I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very um, firm in, in, in what I assign to my students. I always give them choices. It's like you can choose any of these five pieces, but those five pieces all have some, some technical skills that the student can't skip. And I right. tell my students, you know, uh, for example, many times I'm, I'm asked, um, 
how do you improve sight reading? You know, I, I think that many people think that there is a magic formula to improve sight reading. <laughs> uh, just being exposed to a lot of music, opening a score, playing it. But at the same time, <clears throat> for example, I think etudes are a wonderful tool to to improve sight reading because they are based on patterns. Yeah, I, I used to uh, assign, for example, chain etudes as a sight reading. Because chain etudes, uh, for example, they're the very easy ones, right? So those etudes that you can just open just like one page. They have certain patterns. Chenny must have been a wonderful teacher because uh, all the etudes are written in a way that if the students really would go one after the other, learn one etude after the other, they have learned a pattern and then the pattern is modified a little bit and modified a little bit. So sight reading is a little bit easier because you just need to pay attention to the one thing which is different at one point, right? And it, that you don't know and you know to a kind of a scale that you never had before. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really, that that's the magic formula. I mean, it's not magic, it's just, um, yeah. And, and I think the idea of, of knowing what kind of repertoire you assign to students, it's, it's vital, you know? And so uh, when, I, when I assign etudes, I think, you know, I can pick, okay, this etude is only two page, long mm -hmm. or maybe this etude is only one page long but usually etudes are based on one or two technical elements and they're usually right. a main pair so you know it, it develops that and then i and then i tell my students well um you know if you read one every other week by the end of the semester you have eight and it doesn't matter if you know not all of them are, are a great level but maybe out of those eight you you really polish and, and you bring to performance level two then two are a good level maybe not as as high as the yeah. other two. but even with the four that they are just like a very normal level you read you moved your hands and and so um i so to to go back to your question i think that sometimes uh the approach that i see from private teachers and and sometimes also in university is this idea that okay here are your four pieces that you have to learn for the end of the semester for your recital for your jury read those four pieces let's just spend time on those four pieces or three or five and that's it. And and I and I think it's very counterproductive because also students spend the first month reading everything and, and they are exhausted because yeah. they just have everything new and, and you know there is not much you know musical gratification because they're really going through through the uh, to the tough part of the work. And then once they have read all the rap, then they spend three months in which they don't read anything else. And so of <laughs> course when the next semester comes and they have to learn new pieces like oh last time i read something new was four months ago and so yeah that's that's an approach that i saw many times you know this is your package of of pieces learn them yeah. and then you know and i think you know it's way more fascinating to have something short that you can read every week and something mm -hmm. long term and something you know midterm so a piano lesson is structured in such a way that you might consider that you know hour half an hour of lesson as embedding five subjects, which is like, you know, technical exercises, uh, sight reading exercises, um, I don't know, baroque pieces, romantic pieces, uh, improvising, uh, composing, uh, you know, all those type of things that, can, that have to be there in order for you to become a pianist who can think and do whatever you want to do, because that's that should be the goal, right? Not to learn one sonata for the senior recital and one sonata for the junior recital and then you're done with that, you might tell me more about how would you suggest, you know, really have to approach piano learning in general uh, for somebody who is serious about learning how to play the piano. Because I really believe that everybody might uh, learn effectively if they have the right strategies in place. If you really want to learn something, right, you need to know the system, <laughs> how that works, mm -hmm. and then you utilize the system and then you you just you put the time, the effort, the discipline, uh, consistency and perseverance, and then at one point you get it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you don't know the system, it's a little bit difficult. So you might put all the other ingredients, but then... So uh, I think you, you, you are pinpointing a very, very delicate aspect of piano teaching. And uh, I, I'm going to say something that maybe it's, it, it may be obvious, but it's something that I, I deal with every time. I, I think that I, I do believe that we can 
think of the best strategies. Mm -hmm. But what I feel most of the time is that we don't give ourselves enough time. Mm -hmm. And we don't give ourselves enough time as learners. You know, so, and, I, and I'm thinking about this in every kind of setting. I see that with my private students, with my prep department students, as well as my, as my college students. So I think that everything you said is, is absolutely right. But then in order to go over with the student, you know, over those things and, and make sure that the student understand, uh, make sure that the student can try with the teacher, make sure that the student can apply so that during the week the student is not lost and knows how to practice. I mean, this takes a lot of time. And, and what I what I experience constantly is like feeling so crunched, you know, even even music majors, sometimes they just have one hour lesson. And it's like, if you want to work at some level, a certain level, you need to spend more time. But this also happens with with um, young students. You know, I, I'm amazed by how many teachers offer 30 minute lesson or even 45 minute lesson. And and when I was a child, when I when I studied with my first piano teacher, I always had one hour lesson. It didn't feel like one hour because I was doing so many different things. And, you know, I was doing my technique, I was doing my reading stuff, I was playing my little pieces. But then uh, my first piano teacher was giving me like some pop music with chord charts. It's like, hey, Fabio, I'm gonna teach you how to play C major chord. I'm gonna teach you how to play F major chord. And so I, I really felt that there was always a lot of time and a lot of mm -hmm. space. Right. Um, and so I think that we do focus a lot on strategies and, you know, attention span. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's important because, you know, we need to optimize our time. But I think we should, we should not forget the fact that uh, we should also think about time in the long term, not, not in the short term. Yes. And so I, I was reading a, a book by Gisking and I, I, I was like uh, surprised because it was saying, oh yeah, I was, a, I was a little child and, you know, I was like probably five or six, I don't remember. And, you know, my teacher was giving me a 30 minute lesson, but then the next sentence was like, and I was having four lessons in a week. I, I think that honestly, honestly, that's, that's the answer. And so, for example, when I have some, some students that want one hour lesson, I'm, I'm talking about like 10, 11, 12 years old, but even high schoolers that, that have one hour weekly lesson, I tell them, you come twice for 30 minutes mm -hmm. and so it's like so you have you know you know that you you meet me twice you have specific goals for every lesson and right. it's funny because i think that this thing about music is so uniquely wrong because no one practices a sport once a week one hour right yeah. you know yeah. if you go to basketball coaching and soccer tennis you probably go three times at least twice and so yeah. Uh, this is not to undermine the fact that strategies are important. I think if we if we don't find the, the right time first, mm -hmm. how many strategies can we look for? But, you know, and, and so um, yeah. I, I, I do think that also depends on the context. You know, I think that yeah. if a piano teacher is doing, a piano teacher, just like, you know, instrumental teacher is doing everything, then it would be really nice to have a long lesson or maybe even two weekly mm -hmm. lessons where, okay, one lesson we focus more on technique and repertoire, the other we focus more on, you know, ear training, musicianship, things like that. Right. Uh, or sometimes I think that some music academies offer these classes on top of that. And so that maybe it's a little bit easier for the piano teacher because that's, a you know, it's okay to focus more on yeah, I read somewhere that in Japan they have lesson every day, but I think it is the financial aspect then which plays a role. In, in Germany, the Klavierstunde is 45 minutes, so uh, the piano hour, right, is 45 mm -hmm. minutes long. That's how they call it. So it's uh, Stunde is an hour, but the hour is 45 minutes. The usual time that they spend uh, once a week for piano lesson, and my music school because of the you know, it was financially not affordable. Uh, they had divided this 45 minutes into two 
which made uh, the lesson for each student uh, 22 minutes and 30 seconds long. But I agree with you that, you know, if the students would have more time with the teacher, they would spend more time really kind of the music lessons and piano classes that obviously practice wouldn't be a problem because the mm -hmm. student would at least practice two times with the teacher and at least three times without the teachers so it makes four times a week of practicing uh, and then if they would practice every day then you know that, that would be perfect because they might make a mistake by practicing then you correct it you know right away and mm -hmm. uh, it, you know it makes life for the teacher and for the students much easier right so mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it may be, it may be, a, you know, a, a financial issue. I also think it's a mindset issue, and and you know, it may be that we want the students to do five different things or six different things. And sometimes I look at my students' schedule, and it's busier than mine, or as busy as mine. And it's like, okay, is is this a good idea? So I, again, I I don't want to undermine the, the teaching strategies. I, I'm thinking are we creating space in the first place to make this successful? Yeah. And, you know, and I also totally agree with you that it's like, you know, we, we need the students to be proficient on, on different levels. And it's like, you know, that's what I am really grateful for, why I'm really grateful for my first piano teacher that, you know, I was doing, you know, pop music and, and playing chord charts and, and skills that have nothing to do with becoming a pianist in the, in the, uh, you know, more common uh, understanding of that definition. But uh, <clears throat> so to, to maybe to, to give an answer that can be a little bit more specific, something that I like to do with my students regarding regardless of their level is make sure that if it's a piano lesson, everything happens through piano. And mm -hmm. so, you know, even if we are doing theory, yeah. yes, we can talk for 10 seconds about how to build try it but then right. it has to be immediately on the piano it doesn't have to be on the you know on the on the music paper or it doesn't have to be you know so i think that that's for example that that's something good that we can do with with our instrument i i think that the you know one of one of the difficult things is really to make sure the students know how to practice i think this is a problem that yeah. we all have um so i know that i cannot you know push my students family um, beyond right. their possibility but something that i strongly encourage I, I now i'm at the point where i uh, immediately ask the parents to sit in the lesson and mm -hmm. right now i just started to i have two new students they are going into first grade they're really cute really bright and i ask the parents can you stay here and take notes Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know uh, and that's gonna be wonderful and sometimes I saw uh, I was in, in different situations where I never saw the parents or what the parents said in the mm -hmm. lesson they were on their cell phone so it's like you know we don't have a perfect world but but you know we can yeah. we can create those things that really help I teach uh, partially uh, using the Suzuki method partially right now because I had to switch a little bit and adapt to this new environment here in the States. Uh, um, in Germany, it was a little bit easier for me to teach the Suzuki method because the parents were there for the kids at all times. So I had parents who came to the lesson with the kids and stayed home with the kids every day. And here in the States, it is a little bit different because parents work a lot. And uh, at times they don't have uh, the actual time to sit with the kid and practice, uh, right? Or kind of to support the practice time um so i had to adapt that aspect a little bit because then on the other hand they want students to take piano lessons uh you can force yourself as a teacher into their family routines and their, their dynamics so i cannot do that then at one point depending on the type of family i prefer the parent to stay out of my studio and if that's that's the case right that the parent uh, cannot really deal with music is not so interested then i prefer to deal with the kid alone and so i'm kind of flexible i became flexible with that because i i needed really my students to to be successful and happy with the lessons so and i switched the mindset into good i'm here i'm trying to provide a service to these kids 
first of all, the kids are my uh, clients, let's say that, right? Mm -hmm. And my customers. And uh, if the parents cooperate in that way, it's fine. Otherwise, as a teacher, I need to find something else. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree that taking notes, you know, having the parents there is helpful because obviously, you know, especially uh, in the case of very, very young students, uh, mm -hmm. they might go home and forget what you taught them. How would you structure your career as a pianist? Like, uh, if we want to be successful in anything, we, we should have a plan, right? A plan of actions. So I do this, 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 so that, you know, at one point I will be able to have a solo recital and then have a couple of concerts around how would you approach that let's say that i, I already have already started taking piano lessons and i'm pretty proficient i'm pretty good like i, I enjoy that and i like it and i practice this is the setting so what would you suggest to that student well my my first suggestion of course would be my, my two main recommendations would be find a very good teacher mm -hmm. uh that's you know that's a very important thing especially i'd say until you are i mean there, there is not of course an age limit but but you are your best moment i think until you are 25 30 for you know so mm -hmm. it's like it's really important to have an excellent teacher if you want to do that seriously uh up to that age um because after the age, I mean, of course, you can still find ways to learn, but but it's it's a little bit different. Um, so having a great teacher, and second is making making space and time for that, um, which to me means being driven by an extreme passion, you know. Yes. And and that's that's something that you know it's I think it's a word that we do not emphasize enough, uh, you know we. Uh, when people ask me how how did you get where you are and and honestly it's passion you know i um i i just remember just being exposed the whole time and you know be, being hungry for music and, and trying things that doesn't mean that i learned in the best way you know i was reading a lot of music and not refining it so that was a problem of mine but it's like just just be hungry and i and i think that's those are the two main ingredients you must have if you want to be serious then of course with with the help of a of a really good teacher uh there are specific actions that that you can implement i would say you know start having specific goals and and goals can be can be very different we don't have to go through through the same path you know some some people want to go into competitions that's mm -hmm. great, but not because the competition itself is great, because it gives you a goal. And so you start measuring, you start competing with yourself and, and you want to become better every day. So for some people, maybe that. For some people, maybe, okay, I don't really want to go into competition, uh, but I want to present a new uh, recital program at my uh, in my community. And that can be at your church uh, or it can be your, you know, uh, you know, music school and and then move from there and then it's like okay this year i made one recital next year i'm gonna make two recitals or maybe two different programs and and start networking you know start talking with people that want uh they want you as a performer that they want you as a musician uh don't you know it, it's difficult because we always see the top and we measure ourselves with the top and it's like oh i'll never be able to make it but reality is way more, um, you know, it, it has a lot of, a lot of, you know, inner and hidden spaces. So uh, having, having that kind of personal goal. And again, for someone could be, well, uh, let's say, you know, a little bit out of the classical, you know, classical mm -hmm. sphere. You know, one could be, uh, I want to be an arranger. I want to be a, a pop musician. Well, then maybe... Uh, find some good mentors that help you to understand how to market yourself. Not that classical musicians don't have to, but, you know, maybe, you know, things can be a little bit different. So have a good website or maybe, you know, create, uh, a, you know, a YouTube channel, like, you know, the, exactly what we're doing right now, you know? Uh, and so people, people see you, people, people yeah. start, you know, uh, start knowing you. And, and um, I mean, sure, many won't care, but many will. And so I think, 
I think we we sometimes we make confusion between being famous and and having a career. Those right. are not you know we, we tend to think that those two things are the same, but they okay. are not. You can have a career and not being famous, and so. The, the things that you cannot skip is is being qualified and being proficient at what you do, and and the things that you you cannot you cannot skip is putting time and effort. But once you have done that, you, you can you know you can really create your own platform. And so, um, and I think it's something I have to remind myself all the time. You know, like we, we tend to be comfortable in what we do and and stay there and and complain about the things we can get but um the market the market is wild and it's tough but uh again it, we can also look at the positive side of things you know 50 years ago but maybe even 30 years ago maybe even 20 years ago the only way to be noticed was to want to win a competition and now right you know you can I, have I, your youtube channel you can have your own arrangements you can you know and so yeah. i say People have to be hungry and, and, you know, and also accepting that doing mistakes is fine. You know, you do a yeah. mistake and, and those are important. So having having people that, uh, you know, having mentors and I know people talk a lot about this thing, like having mentors. But so one thing is having a mentor is a person like you need advice that that's fine. But I think that also being specific in what you want so like you say in five years from now i want to be there and so you really look for a person that is there right now that is literally five years ahead of you yeah you know and and so it it, it takes a lot of energy but and that's why i say you must have passion because it does take a lot of energy creativity uh, so i think it's possible and i think i i can prove that because i'm not famous because i moved from a different country when I was 32 uh, and I moved to a place that no one knows, no one <laughs> knew me. And, and now I'm teaching at university. And so it's like, uh, it is possible. And, and, and that's the beauty of it. And I didn't win by Clyburn. I didn't win any competition, but you know, I, I'm where I am. And I'm, so I think people just don't have to, to, to give up and thinking, oh, you know, my my friends are 23, have a business degree, they're, you know, they're making, th things will happen. And so passion is yeah. always the one. And I think especially today, you can, you can create your own platform, your own audience and establish yourself as an authority in your field uh, by simply doing your own things and putting your things out there. You can self-publish your own music right now, right? You can uh, um, record your own music. You can just like be out there. You just have the possibility to be out there and um, not to market yourself as as a musician. So... Yeah, and as, as one of my old teachers said, you know, it's like we, we have also these myths and it's like, you know, I'm wondering if you know, Arthur Rubistan would be here today. Would he be able to make a career? Because again, yeah. we, we take that for granted, but you know, you put Arthur Rubistan in 2022 and you know, who, who knows? Maybe, maybe he would struggle, not because he wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be good enough, but because things are different. And so it's like, it's, you know, so some myths are, are, are good, but at the same time, it's like, there, there is space for everyone. We tend to forget that the audience today is different than the audience even 10 years ago, right? The audience 10 years ago might have liked something else than the audience today. We think that we should only play Mozart and Chopin and, I don't know, Beethoven and Bach in order to be considered classical pianists. Why don't you make those classical compositions cool enough for the uh, modern audience, you know, and then mix them up with something uh, that the audience really uh, is enjoying. Think about, okay, who is my audience? Is my audience enjoying uh, 90 minutes of Bach something? Maybe not if they're not familiar with that. So maybe you should adjust your thoughts to taking into account that we live in a different world. Yeah. What are your thoughts about uh, um, improvisation and composition in piano lesson? Uh, to be honest, I don't really have, uh, you know, much experience uh, for that, in that. Um, so I haven't really worked specifically on, on you know, on, on those two two uh, aspects. Um, 
And also I didn't have students that, you know, came to me and it's like, oh, I want to play my my own composition. So it's not something that I, I encountered often. You know, I sometimes I, I like to play with students and, you know, start from, from a, you know, a piece of music we are working on and I'd say, you know, okay, this is the phrase that the composer wrote. Can we change the phrase a little bit? Can we change the note? So, you know, the, yeah. the rhythm can be different, but you know, that two measure phrase, you can change the notes, but you know, yeah. so it's like making, changing the pieces of a puzzle. And so, uh, because also I don't have honestly any training in, in improvisation, but, uh, and composition, but I, I like to think that those skills can be even built from the from the you know classical repertoire and and yeah. uh, so something you know a, a game that i i do a lot of time and and i think the mozart is a wonderful composer to do that it's like okay look what mozart wrote but he could have also have written this passage in this way or this other way and you know um so i i really enjoy doing that with my my college students and it's like you know if you try four or five different ways in which you could have changed this phrase First, you, you develop your creativity, you open your ears, and then you also understand, or at least you appreciate why Mozart wrote it in this specific way. You know, then, then there is a unique flavor to, to those notes. So something that I like to do with my students that it's not really improvising or, or composing is, you know, playing on uh, developing some sort of uh, harmonization skills or, mm-hmm. or you know, arrangement skills. And it's like, okay, just play the right hand, put some chords in the left hand, you know, and, and I think we can consider that improvisation somehow. It's just like you don't have a left hand. You just have, I'm just going to tell you the notes that you can use, but then how you play those notes, in which octave, how you arrange them, you know, so probably because I'm not, again, I'm not a trained, uh, you know, improviser or, or composer, but I like to think that both composition and improvisation can start from really simple concepts you know so again honestly i don't really you know i haven't really done that much with my students um sometimes it happens you i think you need to find the right student um but yeah that's that's pretty much what i what i i do so very very simple things I, I would encourage you to read the book by professor uh, girdingen it's called music in the gallant style and it is uh really about the patterns used during the uh, gallant style, you know, the 1800 mm-hmm. um, patterns that composers used to compose their own music and patterns that Mozart used to compose uh, his music. And it's it's a, almost a magical thing. You learn the formula and the students is able to compose simple things, you know, uh, simple eight majors minuet or a simple uh i don't know dance by following that pattern you change just some notes you follow some chord progressions uh, and uh, then you have a new piece and that's how they were able they were able to compose the many so many pieces and i guess what they were doing that in italy but then we have lost that ability to really learn a teacher as a pianist you don't get that in your training but it was part of the training in the conservatories in the past it is a shame that we had lost that over the years uh and i didn't receive that as a training but i'm trying to force myself to train my students to invent a melody and just write some chords uh, that you liked for that melody or imitate that pattern of that piece that you'll learn and change some things. I would invite you to make an experiment with the, your youngest students uh-huh. and just try try to let them free. Most of the time, they like their music much, much better than uh, uh, the music that you would assign that somebody else's with. What are your plans for the future? I would say that, you know, just simply put, uh, I would like to uh, you know, to grow my studio, I'm I'm in in a, in a new environment. I'm I'm working with music majors, and so uh, I do love teaching and I do love performing. So uh, I would like to establish a strong piano studio here at Washington State University. Um, I I want to stay here um, for the foreseeable future. So uh, I feel like it's a really good place where I can put some. You know, I can plant some seeds, and I'm I'm. Uh, you know, I, again, I, as I said before, I think we all need time to see things grow and, and you know, and, and take a good shape. So uh, 
I, I really, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what will happen here in, in my future as a, as a teacher and see, you know, will I have a great studio in five years or six years, you know, will the number grow and, you know, the numbers are already growing, but so that's, that's to me, it's very stimulating because it also feels like it keeps me in contact with, with a lot of, you know, of young people. Um, and then of course, you know, I, I really want to, to perform as much as I can. Uh, because I think that two two parts, you know, teaching and, and performing, and uh, you know, they, they really nurture each other. So yeah. uh, I, I can't really think of ten years from now, but I can tell you that, for example, you know, like my my fall schedule is already is already quite packed. I'd be traveling to Virginia for to Virginia to to uh, Western New York uh, for some solo recitals, and then. Um, Actually, this past year, I've been collaborating with two of my my colleagues, uh, my uh, tuba uh, euphonium colleague and my uh, bassoon colleague, uh, and we have done uh, some recordings. We have recorded music for, for piano and, and tuba and piano and bassoon. Um, so there will be a couple of albums that will be released probably next year of so with with the uh, tuba professor, we worked on uh, music by diverse composers and all uh, newly commissioned music. Mm -hmm. um, with the, the bassoon professor, we we did a, uh, another interesting project was uh, music by Native American composers. Wow! Uh, and so we recorded music by Ballard, uh, by Juan Tio Besanti, and there was a mix between you know uh, living composers and composers from the past. So. Uh, I, I do enjoy uh, collaborating with, with uh, other faculty. So still in the fall, I'll be traveling to um, to probably for surely to Iowa and Arkansas with this uh, piano and bassoon project, and then traveling to Montana with a piano and tuba project. Uh, so those are really the, the things that are coming up first. Uh, so I, I feel like. You know, sometimes it's it's difficult to think. Oh, ten years from now, you know. Of course, I have I have my dream. Um, it's like you know, I I really I really want to expand my repertoire. I feel I'm you know I'm the closest to classical and romantic composers, um, but I I do also enjoy working with with others. So um, one one of my one of my projects I'm gonna apply for it for a fund for that is to work on. Um, Something that has been overlooked, but I think it's wonderful. Those are the uh, drama, so music for uh, voice and piano by list, mm -hmm. uh, but like you know, spoken voice. So it's uh, and it's so he wrote, yeah, he, he wrote five. Uh, I don't know how we say that in English. We we call that melologo in Italian. Uh -huh. uh, and so yeah, just combining this. Uh, this beautiful poetry with, with music by list. And so this is, this is a project. And I, and I hope we'll, we'll get some, you know, visibility because it could also be something that audience can feel drawn to because, you know, I, I was thinking about this project like, oh, wow, this seems like really the predecessor of, you know, kind of soundtrack or maybe even audiobook, you know, like there is a singer or, or an actor singing a story and you hear music. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I think as pianists, we are so fortunate because we have so many things that sometimes we feel like, I don't know where to go, but at the same time, it's yeah. like, okay, I, I can choose so many things and, and the, there is so much good music for our instrument that it's, you know, it's a privilege to be a pianist, honestly.